by Rabbi Kanyan, they explicitly and repeatedly asked him for a short introduction. So uh, Rabbi Kanyan was uh, one of the organizers of the Big Data program, and he was around, involved in a lot of activities, he won many awards, he did many great things, but he wanted you to hear what he has to say, <laughs> and then about clustering data. <laughs> thank you, Elanon, for that introduction, and thank you all for coming. Um, it's certainly warmer here than outside today, so it's a good place to be, but we'll see what the talk does. So uh, I, I phrased the title as a question, Clustering Data Does Theory Help? I won't give you the answer till the end, but I should tell you I'm a theoretician. So, but actually, I'm a skeptical theoretician. Hopefully, you'll see, and uh, maybe that provides the clue. Uh, so first, let me define what clustering is uh, and then tell you something about it. So clustering, as you, uh, probably all of you know, is just the uh, problem of doing the following. You're given n objects, and you want to divide them. In this talk, you'll partition them, so strictly each object will go into one cluster. There are softer versions of these, but for uh, uh, concreteness, we'll focus on this. Partition them into k clusters. k is sacred. It's going to be throughout the talk the number of clusters. Each cluster intuitively should consist of similar or close by objects, and we'll define them in a minute. So for this talk, and for quite a bit of the um, applications and uh, theory, each object is a vector, that's all. So uh, it has one component per feature, if you will, and there are many features. So each object is a very high dimensional vector. Okay? Where D, the number of dimensions, is as many as the number of features that you put in. That's one complication to remember that these are high dimensional vectors. So uh, in some sense, the problem is a lot easier if they were in two or three dimensions, but that's not the case. And we could uh, measure either the similarity between objects. For example, if they are vectors, dot product is a notion of similarity, or cosine of the angle is another notion of similarity. Or we could measure distance, dissimilarity. Most of the talk will measure distances. And these are just pure Euclidean distances. They are vectors in space, and the distances are just Euclidean distances. Now, uh, to sort of introduce part of the title, theoretical computer science, or theoretical operations research, for instance, focuses on the following question. You find an optimal k clustering, an optimal division partitioned into k parts. Now, optimal means one of many possible things one possibility is that you minimize the sum of the distances of each data point to its cluster center. So when I've done clustering, I have some k clusters. Each data point belongs to a cluster, and it has a center. You measure its distance to the center, and perhaps sum them up. This is not the only possibility. We'll see. There are several other possibilities. Or you could maximize the similarities within clusters if you're given similarities. So you could have any number of these objective functions. Perhaps for concreteness, again, we'll focus on one thing, which is the k-means problem, where you minimize not the sum of distances, but the sum of squared distances to cluster centers. It's an interesting phenomenon that in theoretical computer science, almost always you consider just sum of distances. And outside of theoretical computer science, you almost always consider sum of distance squared. So I'm going to step outside. I'm going to consider sum of distance squared. Now, distance squared has some very nice properties for instance, as in linear algebra. Least squares fit, we'll see in a minute. Uh, and that's one reason to consider it. Mathematically, it's nicer to consider distance squared. Okay. Uh, I'll have pictures, uh, not on the same slide, but the next slide, for instance, so hopefully uh, that'll focus some of your attention. Now, it would have been wonderful if I could find the exact optimum. Okay. That would actually solve, that would dispense with the need for this talk or any lots of papers on the subject. But unfortunately, uh, many headaches would be gone if we can exactly optimize. But unfortunately, exact optimization is NP-hard. If you're not familiar with what NP-hard is, uh, it's very unlikely that we would have an efficient algorithm. We don't have one now. It's very unlikely we would have one for solving this problem ever exactly. So we have to settle for approximate optimization. And that's going to create a lot of trouble for us. Okay? That's one of the reasons, actually, for this talk of, for many things in the subject. OK, here is a, just a little picture to focus our mind. Uh, here is a problem with k equals 5, 5 clusters. I'm given points on the plane. That's all I can draw. And I, I wasn't given the colors. That's the clustering. 
the algorithm or whatever has come up with these colors. There's a blue cluster, uh, uh, green cluster, and so on. I don't know what to call that color, but anyway. So these are uh, five clusters here. And I put down for each cluster a center, the plus mark. That's a cluster center. You take each point and its distance to the cluster center and square it and sum. That's what you do in k-means. Okay. And you want to minimize that. Now, uh, one slide I would have normally put up, but I presume it's completely obvious, is that clustering has a lot of applications. So I should have put up the areas in which clustering has applications. Instead, just me rhetorically just ask, what area does clustering not have applications to? It really has applications, a lot of areas. So I won't put that up. Uh, but the ultimate goal in all the applications is to find the correct clustering, correct in red. Now, that's the ultimate goal, but there are differences of view as to what the correct clustering is. Uh, there are three uh, viewpoints that I want to stress in this talk. The first is theoretical computer science says, well, the optimal clustering is obviously the correct one, right? Uh, maybe I cannot find it, but that is the right one. Okay. Now, statistics says the clustering, correct clustering, is the one used by the invisible hand. This is like the invisible hand in economics. Uh, in a minute, you'll see what it is. But it's the um, data generator. So there's a model of data, and the invisible hand generates the data and gives it to you. And uh, whatever the invisible hand used, whatever cluster it used to generate the data in the first place is the correct clustering. In a few slides, we'll see models that uh, sort of shed more light on this basic statement. But here's the most interesting definition of clustering, which is from the practitioner. The practitioner says, to hell with you, give me the answer, and I'll tell you whether it's correct or not post facto. Now, there's, I mean, this sounds unfair, but it's really actually fair because, I mean, how would you tell if you're a biologist what is the correct clustering? You want the correct clustering. You cannot... Uh, uh, you know, I, a prior I defined the correct clustering. And that is actually a basic problem with evaluating clustering at all because you don't know what the correct answer is until you go and confront the... Uh, so this is, I don't know, I got a picture of the invisible hand. Uh, I'm lazy to draw pictures, but you can download them. This is supposed to be a blackjack table, by the way. Uh, so, okay. So what did theoretical computer science do? A lot of effort has gone into developing approximate algorithms for k-means clustering or for other, other criteria. And the reason is the exact one is not solvable. Now, I won't provide a history of all the uh, uh, sort of uh, achievements or papers or, along these lines, except I want to mention some of the ultimate ones, which are actually quite simple. So it, it wasn't so simple all the time, but the final, final papers are quite simple, so it's easier to mention. So here is the... Um, um, slide of what we know roughly at the current state of knowledge. Some of these are maybe eight or nine years old. First, spectral methods, they are quite old. Um, uh, and I'll tell you what they are. They are going to play a big role in this talk. Spectral methods yield a solution with k means at most a constant times optimal. And to tell you what a basic spectral method is here uh, will, will happen in the next slide. But on this slide, I want to uh, say what theory has done over and beyond this constant factor. So here the error is constant factor times the optimal. That error can be made pretty small, epsilon times the optimal for any positive epsilon, so relative error epsilon. Uh, they are now available for, uh, for instance, for k-means. And over time, they become very simple. In fact, they are simple enough that the idea of this I'll be able to describe in this slide. And this is due to Kumar Sabarwal and Sen. It's about eight or nine years ago, but it's really based on a series of developments due to uh, these authors and many more authors, actually. So here's what this, uh, here was this does. So I want to get an epsilon approximation. It gets it in linear time very fast when k is constant. So the time dependence is exponential in k. So if the number of clusters grows, we are in trouble. But uh, one assertion is in a lot of applications, k is small. You have many points, maybe uh, millions of points, maybe in hundreds of dimensions, but the number of clusters you see is 30, let's say. So k is 30, right? k is small. So this is reasonable. What does this algorithm do? It's based on a couple of simple observations that I want to get across. I won't get you, of course, the details of the algorithm, but uh, just to see what the simple ideas are. So the starting idea is extremely simple. To get the center of one cluster, so 
I want to figure out for each cluster the center. Uh, one remark that's useful to have is once I know the center of the clusters, then I'm done. Because I put every point to the center that it's closest to, right? So if I have the centers, I'm done, okay? So the object is to partition, I said, in clustering. It really is enough to find the centers. So to get the center of one cluster, let's see how we can do it. One little fact I should have told you is the centroid is the correct center. It's not very difficult to see, right? Sum of squares is minimized when I take the centroid of the points as a center. That's a little calculation, but that's all it is, right? Now, I want to get the centroid of a lot of points in a cluster. Little observation you have to calculate to make sure this is correct is that centroid of a small random sample is a good approximation to the centroid of the whole cluster. Good in the sense of the k-means cost. Okay. So, uh, in principle, this is intuitively obvious. You have to do a calculation to make sure that that's correct. So, I can get the center of one cluster if only you gave me a random sample of points from uh, that cluster. What's the rub here? What's the problem? Why couldn't I always do this? Well, the problem is, I don't know which points belong to a cluster. So I cannot sample and hope to get points from just one cluster. My sample will contain points from all clusters. I, and I, don't, I, I cannot differentiate them. Right. But here's what they say to solve that problem. You take a random sample of all data. That's all you can do. You have no labeling as to. So in, in the machine learning setup, this is unlabeled learning, unsupervised learning. You don't have labels as to what, where points belong to which clusters, otherwise you'd be done. So you take a random sample of all data. Surely that contains a subset from the largest cluster. It may not contain a very good subset from small clusters because they're too small to be sampled, but certainly from the largest cluster, it would contain enough points to suffice for this estimate. Okay. But I don't know what those points are, right? I only have a sample. I know some subset came from one cluster. I don't know which subset. Otherwise, I'd be done. Well, let's try all subsets. Now, uh, I should say this seemingly trivial idea that you don't know which subset defines, in this case, a cluster, but in other problems, other things. And you try all subsets because you need to try only small subsets. has played a big role. There are several algorithms, for instance, for the maximum cut problem that are based on such a simple starting idea. So you just try all subsets, pretend that the subset is from the same cluster, okay. find the center, right? Then you peel off the cluster close to the centroid of that subset, and then you repeat. Well, you won't necessarily be correct because you pretended it belonged to the same cluster, but it may not have. But if you're wrong, no problem. One of, the, one of your attempts will be correct, and you will measure them against each other just by measuring the k-means, and you'll get the right one. So this is sometimes known, this kind of technique is sometimes known as exhaustive enumeration, where you pick a sample and try all subsets, and you know which one, for each one, how good it is, and then you take the best one. Now, uh, this cannot go beyond constant size subsets because of the enumeration. Unfortunately, it cannot do that. So it's easy to see with some calculation that you cannot beat a constant factor. So you cannot beat a small constant factor. In other words, I cannot make this epsilon go to zero. Okay? The epsilon remains a small constant. And we'll see that that's going to cause us problems. We need, it'll, it'll turn out that in a lot of practical examples, we need epsilon going to zero. Okay. Now I want to introduce uh, spectral clustering. Uh, again, uh, many of you will be familiar with this, but uh, what I've done, try to do here in two or three slides is given you, try to give you the cleanest or simplest presentation of it, which we know by now. We didn't actually happen upon this in the beginning, the field as a whole. We had very complicated descriptions, and now what we have here is a very simple description. Hopefully you'll find that. So uh, let's say that there are n data points. The, each of them is a vector, remember, and we want to cluster them. Um, uh, they ignore the picture for a minute. Uh, the K means clustering wants you to find K cluster centers, call them C1 through CN. And uh, I'm sorry, there are K cluster centers and you make C1 through CN. C1 is the cluster center for A1 and so on. You, each of these needs to be one of the centers that you found. And you want to minimize the sum of squared distances between AI and CI. Okay. Now, I don't know how to solve this problem. This is NP hard. But here's a similar problem that I can, in fact, solve. And a lot of you will recognize what the solution is. Instead of requiring that the CI 
each of them be one of k distinct vectors, if the ci were one of k distinct vectors, the rank of the matrix C, I put down each ci as a row, the rank is k, right? So instead, relax the condition constraint to say that the rank of C is at most k, instead of having k distinct rows. Let's see what this buys us. Well, if, if you know your linear algebra, you know that this buys us immediately an efficient algorithm. This is just singular value decomposition or principal component analysis, as we'll see in a minute, right? So then the space spanned by CI is, so what does this say? I want a rank K matrix so that the sum of squared distances is minimized, but that's the least squares fit, K dimensional subspace. Least squares fit is just what it means in calculus. That is, I take the sum of squared distances and take the minimum, right? Just like in calculus, the least squares fit line, right? So uh, here you take the perpendicular distances of the space. And that is, uh, if you recall your linear algebra, that can be found by singular value decomposition or that's principal component analysis. If you don't recall your linear algebra, don't, bo don't worry about it at this point. Just remember this picture. Here is a bunch of points I've given here in 3D and K is two in this, in this picture. So I want to find the best two dimensional fit. And I have tried to show that in this picture. It's the um, two dimensional plane whose orthogonal vector, whose normal is V. Okay. So that can be found by linear algebra. If you, if you don't recall it, that can be found. So I can find the best least squares fit K dimensional subspace, even though I couldn't solve the original problem, I can solve what's called this relaxation. Okay. Um, now, I, I should apologize for some of you familiar with this area. This will be elementary, but I do hope I'll give you something that's, uh, that's new. Yes, I have a question. The, okay, good. So, CIs are the cluster centers. Point I belongs to some cluster. Its center is CI. But the Cs are not N different things. They are only K different things. So each uh, cluster center will appear many, many times among the CI. Is that clear or? No, we don't know CI. We don't know the CI. Finding the CI is the problem. Finding the CI is the problem. And we don't know how to find the CI to minimize the sum of square distances. That's NP hot. But we do know how to find the space spanned by CI so that the distance to the subspace is minimized, squared distance. By the way, this only works for squared distance, right? Least squares fit is not possible. It's, I think it's, in fact, NP hard if I didn't put the word square there. Okay. It turns out for square, I can find it because of the magic of linear algebra. OK, so again, uh, instead of finding the k cluster centers minimizing the sum of square distances, PCA found us the k dimensional subspace minimizing the sum of distances. OK, uh, this is. It is expands to principal component analysis, right, PCA. So the natural next step intuitively would be, I found this uh, space, I project down to it and then cluster there. Okay? I project the data down to it and then cluster there. If I was good at drawing pictures, I should have drawn a picture of the projection, but you can just imagine like the, the picture I showed you there. All the data is projected onto this k-dimensional space and then you cluster. Okay? Uh, now, the advantage here is, K is smaller than D, so you've gained something by reducing the dimension. And this, uh, uh, sp uh, the folklore spectral clustering says that this works. Okay, does it really work? And we'll see that it works under stochastic models. In a minute, I'll formulate the models and we'll see that. And in fact, even under, without stochastic models, it works. That's more recent stuff. But I want to pause for a few slides from clustering to talk about the glories of PCA per se, principal component analysis, because that's a very big tool in this, as well as many areas. Okay. Now, uh, some of you, when you think of spectral clustering, will think of a different algorithm, and that is to project repeatedly on the second eigenvector. Uh, this is due to Fiedler, and uh, she and Malik, for instance, used this for image segmentation. It has a lot of applications. Please forget that algorithm for this talk, because I'm going to focus on projecting down to the k-dimensional space. Okay? and one-shot clustering rather than repeatedly clustering on one-dimensional projections. Okay. Now, again, I promise you that I'll formulate a simple property of PCA, which is used to get rid of noise. Here it is. So you have uh, 
you have the real data, that lies in a k-dimensional space. Okay? You're not given that. That's what you would like to get. Noise has been added to it, and together they form the matrix A, and that's what you're given. So from A, I need to figure out C. I need to get rid of the noise. And the spectral clustering folklore is that if I take A, project to the k-dimensional principal subspace, that's going to get me more or less C, right? Just projecting it to the PCA subspace is going to get more or less C. Okay. Now, is that true? And we, I want to state uh, something about it that's simple to state and is true. Now, for a moment, assume that the noise is roughly equally spread in all directions. That means there's no particular direction so that a lot of noise is focused in that direction. So the dot product of the noise vectors with that direction is too high. That would be bad if, if it's true for one direction. Suppose that's not true, then in fact the following turns out to be the case. Now it's not important exactly what the numbers are, but I want to remark qualitatively on this. It turns out then you can prove that the error of PCA, that's A bar is supposed to approximate C, right? A bar is supposed to approximate the real data. That error is at most k over d times the total noise error. So what does it mean? That means when k is very small, here is the actual, okay, so this is the actual um, uh, inequality. A i bar, or the data points projections, they are supposed to approximate the true data c i. And the sum of squares is at most, this is noise, the sum of noise squares, but times k over d, and that's a big win if k is much less than d. This is the essential use of PCA, right? If K is much smaller than D, as in fact in a lot of applications it is, then this is much better. Okay. Now, I want to uh, spend uh, one slide telling you formally, for those of you in the audience who know all about norms, just to say what this statement really is and give you a lemma. Uh, and again, sort of remark that it was not always this simple, but uh, denoising is formally stated and proved, usually with a lot of assumptions, but really it's a very simple lemma with a five-line proof once I give you the lemma, you can go home and prove it. But we didn't actually arrive at this lemma so, uh, a clean lemma so easily. It took us some while. Uh, maybe not everyone, but it took at least us some while. So here's the lemma. Uh, this actually, the first proof is due to a Cleopatra and McSherry. The proofs were sort of longer. Um, here's a proof uh, I have with Hobcroft. So the statement is this. You have any matrix, and you project it to its k-dimensional principal subspace. And C is any matrix with a low rank. Then the following is true. On the left-hand side, you have the error when you take the projection minus true data, right? But you take F here, which is the sum of squares of all the entries, the Frobenius norm. On the right-hand side is the spectral norm. Uh, that is, uh, this is just this 2, sub 2 here denotes the maximum overall unit length vectors of this. So what this is really saying intuitively is on the left-hand side, you have a d-dimensional distance in the full space. On the right-hand side, you have only one-dimensional distances. So the error in all of D dimensions is at most a small constant times the error in one dimension, in any one direction. That's what this lemma is saying. And once you have this lemma in front of you, it's very easy to prove. I want to remark on one fact that's quite uh, striking uh, about this as well as other things I'm going to say. You took A and found one projection A bar, right? And some of the assertions is for any C, this is true. So your A bar is close to C for any C at all. Okay. Now how can that be, right? That is so because for bad Cs, there are lots of infinitely many Cs, but for many Cs, this is very large, the right-hand side. So the inequality is not saying anything very useful. Okay. So in fact, this is true for every C, uh, even though you found just one projection. So let me uh, recall uh, one more time project and cluster. Project data points to the space band by the top k singular vectors. And then you do an approximate projection in the cluster, uh, approximate clustering in the projection. And here you use all the machinery developed by theoretical computer science. Okay. If data was generated by a mixture model, and we'll see what this is now in a minute. Uh, if data was generated by a stochastic model, then this works. In fact, even if data was not generated by a stochastic model, we'll see that this provides a good start for what's called the k-means algorithm, uh, from which we get rapid convergence. Now, so, excuse me. 
So I want to uh, pause for a minute from clustering, uh, say something about PCA, and go back to clustering. Uh, I'll do that a couple of times. So here is a, a general question. So PCA is not only used for clustering, it's used for a lot of things. One can ask, uh, can we do something efficient about carrying out PCA? Usually it's an n-cubed algorithm if you want to do it stably, but can we do better? So one question that's come up maybe about 10, 15 years ago is, can we not work on the whole matrix, instead draw a subsample of the matrix, pick a few rows and columns, and do PCA only on the sample. Is that going to tell us anything about the whole matrix? And now, uh, in 95, we came up with an algorithm where we said we can, in fact, do that if we pick rows and columns with probability proportional to the square of their length. It turns out these probabilities, again, the square here is the same kind of reason as the mathematical niceness of least squares fit. It turns out these are not practical. These require very high polynomial times in terms of the error bounds, right? But uh, uh, if you attended some of the workshops in this uh, big data semester, you would have seen a decade of development by many people. Uh, two of the people who did this and who also organized workshops, Petros Junayas Mahoney, uh, presented sampling base, presented methods, and with the final result, or with the result today that they could say, sampling-based methods are now a crucial ingredient of computing with large matrices. Okay. So some other theory originally wasn't so good in, in terms of practicality, but it was improved, and it's now at a stage where it's quite a staple. Okay. Now, one result out of this lot I would like to really emphasize is uh, due to Clarkson and Woodruff, and this is a very nice self-contained result, and I want to state that. It gives you nearly the best approximation, low rank approximation to A can be found in linear time, where time is linear in the number of non-zero entries. Okay. Now, often the matrix matrices you see, big matrices are sparse, so they have very few non-zeros, so you want running times in terms of that, and in terms of that, this is linear, and that's based on a beautiful idea called subspace embeddings, which is a self-contained statement here that they prove, Clarkson and Woodruff proof, uh, which uh, I'd like to draw your attention to. So it says the following. If you have a random matrix, which is R by N, R is much smaller than N. N, by the way, is a dimension of A. Okay. Now, the matrix has just one entry per column, which is plus or minus one, chosen at random. Then simultaneously for all vectors, that's very important. There are infinitely many vectors X. And for every one of them simultaneously, the length of S times A times X approximates the length of X, length of AX. So whatever you were going to do with A, you could do with S times A, which is much smaller. That's the moral of this story. And uh, indeed, the point that A is, S is so sparse is very helpful. Okay. Now, that took some time to come to. It was a, a conclusion of many other results. Uh, but I won't state all the results, but this is very simple to state. Okay. This is a random, it's called subspace embedding. It's a random subspace embedding. Okay. Now, I won't say more about this, but now I want to go to the statistical models by uh, drawing some pictures here. So I want to introduce mixture models from statistics. Uh, what are mixture models? They are models that, they are models of probability densities. Probability density is defined in high dimensional space. In this picture, I'm defining it on the plane. Okay. Uh, there are, uh, this in this picture is a mixture of four simple Gaussian densities. The red, the yellow, the green, and the blue. Each of them is a Gaussian. You weight the densities and add them. That's your mixture, right? And what I've drawn in the plane is samples according to that mixture, right? So it's a probability density on two space and the vertical dimension is the, is the probability density. Okay. More formally, here's a mixture model. It's a density on D space that's a weighted sum of simple probability densities, like the Gaussian. Okay. So you weight them with non-negative numbers summing to one. You add them up, it's a weighted convex combination of those densities. Now, the mixture model hypothesizes that data points are n IID samples, where you pick each sample according to the mixture. So for each sample, you pick one of these guys with the right weights and pick from that density, right? And that's how, uh, excuse me, that's how these points were picked, right? So you pick the red 
density with a certain weight, and then you pick a point from that. Uh, they lie, a lot of points lie about the mean of that red density. Okay, so this is probably the most important picture of the slide, so let me spend a minute on that. It's an extremely simple picture, but it is very important. So here is a picture of two uh, nefarious Gaussians, actually. This is going to be uh, something you should test all your algorithms on in some sense, is what I'm going to say. You have two Gaussians in D space. The standard deviation is sigma in each direction, each direction. But you are living in D space. Now, in D space, the distance to a data point from the center is root D times sigma. It's Pythagoras theorem, so there are D dimensions, the squares add up, the variances add up. So the uh, standard deviation is sigma, the variance of sigma squares add up. So you are at distance root D sigma. Here's the second Gaussian, center separated by a few sigmas, and those points are at root D sigma. What's bad about these two Gaussians is their points are very far from the center compared to the, uh, compared to the distance between the Gaussians, right? So the mean squared distance for a point from the center is D times sigma squared. Okay? But the inter-center separation is only a few sigmas. Okay? Now, if I did approximate clustering, that's, I'm doing k-means, I'm measuring squared distances. If I did approximately, I can make an error of epsilon times d times sigma squared per point, right? And that's very bad because that allows me to put a lot of points from this cluster along with this cluster and still be right according to this criterion, right? The error is too much. Okay? The correct error we should allow is in terms of sigma, but we are allowing error in terms of d times sigma squared. Okay, I should have drawn a picture. Well, uh, I, you can imagine these Gaussians projected to one dimension. If I project to, to them to the one-dimensional axis, then they become nice because they become Gaussians with sigma as a standard deviation. There's no root D, there's no D. D goes away, so they look nice. Okay? But that picture I didn't put up. So uh, here now is something that probably all of you are familiar with. In one dimension, if you have two Gaussians of standard deviation, one each, if the inter-center separation is a many standard deviations, you can tell them apart. If it's far less than one over 100 standard deviations, of course you cannot tell them apart. If it's zero, they collapse. Can you say something like this for d dimensions? Well, it seems that you should be able to. It's, it was not that simple. There's a beautiful result of Impala and Wang, maybe about 15, 12 years back, which says, in fact, a similar result holds for d dimensions. If you have not even just two, but a constant number of spherical Gaussians of standard deviation one each, and the separation between centers is at least a constant. So the mnemonic for this part of the talk is means separated by a few standard deviations. You know, you normally hear of six standard deviations. I'm going to allow a constant number of standard deviations, right? Any big constant, well, constant star even, that's a little bit bigger than constant. If the inter-center separation is at least this, then you can tell them apart. In fact, we could correctly cluster each data point. And you do this by PCA in a way that I probably won't tell you, but w basically what I said, spectral clustering works for this, and the argument is very nice and very simple. Okay. Now, uh, okay, so this now uh, is a little more philosophical part. So this uh, is trying to explain why in practice np hard problems seem to be solved and practitioners merely solve them and go on, and why theoreticians maybe have to reconcile with that. So here's one reconciliation that people have attempted. So practitioners often solve NP-hard problems with heuristics and seem quite happy. Why? Okay. Perhaps when the solution is stable, it's easy to find. And here's a notion of stability that's been studied extensively in TCS. Well, I wouldn't say extensively, but to some extent in TCS, much more needs to be done. Uh, okay, this was formulated by uh, Bilu and Natilineal. So here's a statement for a different problem for max cut. The optimal solution to max cut, they say, is stable if if you arbitrarily change edge weights by a certain factor delta each. Right? Then the solution doesn't change. It still leaves this solution as the optimal solution. So you can ask. For what values of, so if delta is very large, it's a very, very strong condition. Even if I change weights by a lot, the solution doesn't change. So you can say, 
I'd like to make delta as small as possible and still live with it. For what values of delta can we find stable solutions? It's only known for very high values of delta at this point, delta greater than root n. It'd be more interesting to bring it down. More closer to this talk, for clustering, you can formulate a similar notion. And I'll have a picture in the next slide again to explain these notions a bit. But Balkan, Blum, and Gupta formulated this notion. Optimal k-means clustering is stable if any near optimal clustering, near optimal means the values close, differs from C in a small fraction of objects. So if the value is close, then the clustering is also close. That's what it says. That you have to rearrange only a few points. And so if there are stable solutions, they gave some algorithms to find them. So did uh, Daniele uh, Nutti and uh, Mike Sachs. And various other algorithms are also known for this. Now, there are related definitions of stability by a um, um, series of authors. And they're roughly, roughly similar, but slightly different. Okay. So this is a very interesting, promising approach. And there are many questions. But here's the problem. For the notorious two Gaussian picture, the correct solution is not stable. Okay. Now, uh, before I talk about that, here's a picture, sort of a schematic uh, diagram of what stability means, right? So this plane here is the space of clusterings. So there are lots of clusterings. So each clustering has a value, which is in the vertical axis, the third dimension. Okay. The value is the k-means objective function value. Stability says there is a unique minimum, this clustering, that's a stable solution, so that as the value increases, the clusterings also go apart, right? So if the value is uh, close, another way of saying that, if the value is close in the vertical axis, then the clustering is close. So in some sense, this is the unique best clustering, and you really go away from it very fast, okay? It stands out as a, as a clustering. And then the assertion is you can find it. Now, unfortunately, what happens in the two means Gaussian, that, that, that example I showed you is that the k-means value is so large that missed clustering points changes relatively little of the value. So many clusterings have roughly the same value, so that actually the, the third dimension looks more or less flat. The vertical axis looks more or less flat, so it's rather different from this picture. So we now, uh, what I'm uh, now going to do is try to repair this. I want to formulate a notion of stability that works for the two Gaussian case, as well as things we know. And uh, that's a notion of proper. So let me define this. Uh, it's, it's a simple natural definition. So we say a clustering is proper if it's variance now. We don't measure the k-means sum of distance squared. Instead, we measure the max overall dire directions u of the mean squared distance. So I don't measure distances in the whole space. I measure it per direction, right? That's the way to think about it. So this is variance in one direction, okay? Uh, and that has to be optimal, but also the intercluster separation is at least a constant time sigma. Again, the mnemonic is the means are six standard deviations apart, okay? But the means are apart only in the projection, right? We don't care about the whole space. And the two Gaussian picture satisfies this definition of stability. And in fact, under this stability also, you can find the optimal solution. So if there is a proper clustering, C star, if there is a stable clustering in this sense, then in fact, project and cluster finds it. Okay. Finds nearly that. It's off by a fraction of points, but otherwise it finds it. Okay. And the mixture model satisfies proper clustering. This really is sort of falls out of a, a harder theorem, which uh, I probably won't explain, but let me say it, let me read it and then say what it is before going on to the next topic. It is, if there is a clustering C star, such that when data points are projected to the space of centers, each projected data point is closer to its own center than any other center by at least a few sigmas, then project and cluster gives you a good start. When you follow that by Lloyd's algorithm, Lloyd's algorithm is something that many of you know. If you don't know, uh, if there is a few minutes, I'll try to explain. I have some pictures. Otherwise, for the moment, just assume, let me assert that it's one of the most used algorithms in practice. In fact, it proves convergence of this algorithm. 
provided you start with the spectral clustering centers. Yeah. That's right. So we are doing spherically symmetric. There is actually an interesting question whether it extends to general Gaussians, but that I didn't formulate yet, but that's another good question. Okay, so maybe I'll skip Lloyd's algorithm and come back to it. I'll tell you one thing uh, I want that's got some nice pictures, but ah, maybe we should go through this. So in the main, there are two dimension re reduction techniques that we know. There are many variations, but there are two things we know. One is this PCA. It projects high dimensional data points into the best fit linear space. It's used in practice a lot. But clustering is probably one area where we have proofs of its efficacy, proofs that it gives you right answers. Other areas, we don't generally have proofs. In theory, we use a lot the random projection method. That's as a dimension reduction. And the random projection, uh, uh, in fact, it's used a lot for nearest neighbor. This stands for nearest neighbor search, uh, which is just I've given a bunch of points. The query point arrives. You have to tell me what is this nearest point. It's a big problem. It's solved as a probably one of the most used subroutines, so there's a lot of work on that. And what you do is randomly project down to a lower dimensional space. And there you can prove things. PCA, you cannot prove things. It remains an interesting question whether you can actually prove more things about PCA than this, especially for nearest neighbor search, where PCA is used a lot in practice with not many proofs of its efficacy. Uh, I want to spend uh, the last little bit on uh, what is perhaps an extreme, the extreme theory, you might call it, is an attempt to form a set of axioms which tell you what is the correct clustering. Okay? So we struggle with this, and here is something that Kleinberg attempted. Uh, he said a clustering criterion, such as k-means, what does it do? In the abstract, it gives you a mapping that says, if you give me pairwise distances, I give you an optimal clustering for that criterion, right? Now, this is on the lines of, um, if you're familiar with Arrow's theorem, this is attempting to be on the lines of Arrow's theorem, uh, and unfortunately, with the same conclusion. Uh, a, a system of reasonable axioms, any clustering criterion ought to satisfy, it seems to be these are reasonable. Here are three things that Kleinberg put down. Consistency, if we increase distances between points in different clusters, and decrease distances between points in the same cluster, the optimal clustering should still remain optimal. So I found the optimal clustering. Then I take the clusters and say distances between two points in the same cluster, perhaps I reduce them. Distances between points in different clusters, I increase them. It should be even more optimal, right? So it should remain optimal at least. You have to worry a little bit about ties. There might be multiple optimal solutions. Let's not worry about that for the minute. Scale invariance, another reasonable property, which says multiply all distances by the same constant. It should leave the optimal clustering the same. That seems obviously true. And the third property is richness. He says, for any of the... Now, how many partitions of k points, n points are there into k? Uh, sets k to the n. For any of those, there is some distance function for which that is the correct optimal partition. Now, there's no bound on k here, so you can partition in any number of things, and then that should be the optimal clustering. And then Kleinberg proved, as I let, you, let it out earlier, that there's no clustering satisfying all these criteria, all these axioms. And you can say, oops. And the answer is actually not oops. These, uh, these things are too rich, these axioms. They're not something that you ought to require of all reasonable uh, uh, criteria. And here is a, here's a set of axioms which is feasible, and it's just actually a translation of these axioms with the added assumption that things are in Euclidean space, right? So these are abstract distances which satisfy triangle inequality. They can be any distances. There's no necessarily realization in Euclidean space. So if you just assume that it's realizable in Euclidean space, it turns out a very simple, actually natural criterion becomes, um, becomes correct. So we insist on the points being in Euclidean space. There is a criterion satisfying the axioms. Consistency, same thing. That is, if we found the optimal clustering, then we move a point so that its distance to points in its own cluster decreases and to points in different clusters increases. The optimal clustering should still remain optimal. Scale invariance is the same thing. You multiply all distances by the same constant. It should leave the optimal clustering still optimal. Richness, now, 
we have to require that things belong to Euclidean space. So, in the old setup, n points could be partitioned in k to the n ways. If you know your theory of apneic chavanenka's dimension, that is not possible with Euclidean space. You can't partition into so many possible partitions, right? So, here's what the requirement for any set of k points, there's some placement that makes them the centers. Okay. And then the uh, theorem is that balanced k means, so you modify k means slightly, that you want to minimize the sum of distance squared, but you want to keep the cluster sizes the same. The cluster centers among all partitions into k clusters, each with n over k points, does satisfy all these axioms. Okay. Now, I, uh, this, I don't know a lot more about this. It'll be interesting to find out. Maybe there'll be questions on that, but I think I'll stop here. I have reserved slides in case we run out of questions for time or, or run into extra time, but we probably won't. Thanks. Right. Yeah, that's a good question. The reason is that if I take the sum of squares of all pairwise distances, that's some factor times the sum of distance squares to the center. But the factor depends on the number in each cluster. And this proof crucially uses the numbers are equal so that I can relate I can, I, instead of taking distance to the cluster center, I could take all pairwise distances squared and sum them up. So you can replace this axiom by another list of axioms which will be good for the ordinary... So that's possible. I don't know the answer. Uh, it would be nice to do that. That would be good for the ordinary one. I don't know the answer to that. So some of the cluster centers are a derivative concept, whereas pair, all pairwise distances are a given concept. So... That seems to be the issue. Yeah. So do you need here for Euclidean space more than the, just the AC dimension thing? Or are you using the stronger topic of Euclidean space? That's a good question. I don't know the precise answer. I'll have to think about the proof. I may be using, but it would be nice actually not to use all of Euclidean power of Euclid, and you're right, so I don't know the answer. What's the final answer to your question? Okay. Well, I think the final answer is that uh, the answer wants to be yes, of course, right? Um, but, see, I think the complaint sometimes practical or people might have against theory is that we focus on some definite criteria and don't stir out of that. For instance, we focus on k-median instead of k-means, or we focus on constant factors in approximation. And we saw that those things are not very good. On the other hand, all the theory developed, if you slightly modify it, use this projection or whatever modification, then we need to use all the approximation algorithms in the projection. So the theory is very useful. Focusing on a few criteria focuses the mind, so theory gets developed. But I think we have to adapt it a little bit. So that's the answer, that we have to be ready to adapt a little bit. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks.